There's history here. And here. There's history there. History is everywhere. Welcome you here. I have, uh, we're going to do a traditional old bed turning, it's called. This is Linda Allison, and this is Margaret Rambo. And <laughs> um, they are all members of our Siskiyou A's, Henry's Lady, and Rovalier. So we have a team effort going on here. Okay, the very first quilt is not a 1930s vintage quilt. It's 1880s. And I did it on purpose so you can see the drastic change in our color scheme that come through. And the yellow is the cheddar cheese. Um, you'll see red is the turkey red. And then we have one on here that's called secondary mourning. And if a lady lost her husband for the first year, she would wear black. Second year, she would wear kind of a grayish black or a print with a gray. And that was also a signal that she was now available because she was wearing her secondary morning. So it's morning, not like good morning, but morning, boo-hoo, that type of morning, morning cloth. Um, this little quilt, uh, the blocks were all given to the Jacksonville Museum quilters and they um, put it together and hand quilted it. And it's just exquisite hand quilting. Then it was published in a book. It was published in a quilting magazine. And the date on this magazine was 87, I believe. 91, close. And the setting, you would have put it together on the diagonal. So we took us a while to figure out how that went. But anyway, after all those years, that quilt got put together. Uh, it was it was really phenomenal. Um, it's it's flying geese and square in a square is what the middle part would have been. You can come up later and I and look at the pictures too. Yeah, yeah. We usually use um, for our authority uh, Barbara Brockman's Encyclopedia of Quilt Patterns. That helps us the most in identifying some of the blocks and patterns. So I may reference her now and then. She is um, fabulous. She goes into museums and really does a good job of documentation. The next is Sunbonnet Sue. And there is hardly a person alive who doesn't know who Sue is. Is there anyone here that doesn't know a Sue or has seen a Sue in their whole life? Yeah, yeah, or maybe got one as a child. She is probably the most well-known ambassador for the quilting world. And yes, our heir has popular Sioux quilts. This quilt was made in the 30s, and the hand quilting is exquisite. There are 30 Sioux, and every single hat band is different. So whoever made it, and I didn't make it, um, really, use their imagination, because there's no two bonnets alike. The next Sioux, another Sioux, they're all marching to the left. Do you suppose the quilter was left-handed? <laughs> Don't know, but they're all marching to the left. And the hand quilting on this one is 12 stitches to the inch. And the front and the back background are all flower sacks. And that's one reason I brought the flower sack, feed sack collections, because in the 30s they used a lot of feed sack. Okay. This next sunbonnet, Sue, um, this just broke my heart. There's no two Sues alike, but the reason it broke my heart was a lady came by at one of the antique fairs where we were sharing quilting, and she said, would you like to buy this? And I just thought, you know, it's your quilt, and her grandmother made it for her as a child, and the background is little chickens. It is the cutest quilt. 
But she said, no, I need the money worse than I need the quilt. So it came to live with me and I love it. But my heart's still broken because I like to see a family keep their quilt. in the background of the <clears throat> it would be the pink fabric they're little baby chickens <laughs> and there's a little dress up here with little chickens on it too a little tots chickens popular but you have to have a rooster if you're going to have these hands you know so the rooster came <laughs> this next one is called starflower the pattern was designed by Ann Orr She's very famous in our period of time. She did a lot of uh, geometric things, like uh, squares, and then hooked them all together. That was her style. She was also famous um, Lockport. If any of you have heard of Lockport, I think there's a famous uh, Model A parts house there. I've been to Lockport. But Lockport also manufactured batting for the quilters and patterns and and or published through them. That's where she, Starflower. Yeah. Starflower. It's a 1930 designed by Ann Orr. Now at the very top, if you want to relax your arms just a bit and show the top, up here <coughs> is what's called a whisker guard. And under here the, the quilter sewed it on to feed sack. And that's because the men's whiskers were so oily and it just ruined your quilt. And you put that many hours on a quilt and then have some man mm -hmm. drip his oily beard on there. <coughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's called a whisker guard and um, we'll let you put that. Oh, one more thing I wanna tell you though. This binding on this quilt is called knife edge. So they brought the back, which is all feed sack by the way, and the top and poked them together and then often use a knife to get it straight. So it's called a knife edge uh, binding. So they didn't sew a separate piece of fabric on that one. Now my Vanna Whites, they get to sit down a minute because I'm going to talk over here about the feed sack display. Many of the feed sacks up here on the top still have their labels on there and the housewife would send the mister down to the feed store or wherever they were able to get them. I went with my daddy when I was a little girl and mama would holler out, be sure to get four that match because she make a dress from it. And from that dress, then there was leftovers for me a dress and there was dolly clothes dresses and I love feed sacks because they were fun. So I got to help him and they were 100 pound sacks and they were piled high and of course, the ones that matched were at the bottom. <laughs> so the young man at the store had to put them all down. And home we'd go with our four matching feed sacks. And I often got to pick out one that was just for me that wasn't, that mama had. It was mine. And that, that made it really special. Now, not all feed sacks are rough. Some are made out of fine percale. But the only real way you can tell it's a feed sack is you're going to have to see how it was stitched. And this one here has the holes if you held it up to the light. Or if you find one in a store that still has the string attached, then you know. And this little machine right here is called a chain stitcher. And that's what they would have stitched it. And um, this little machine belongs to Margaret Rambo here, and there's a little sign about all about it, so you can come up and read. But it's a cute little machine, and they worked really hard, those little machines, and they just did the chain stitch so you could pull out the string. So this one here is cute. It's it's a child. Um, many of them were fashioned. Holly, they were still available into the mid '60s, so. Uh, feed sacks were very popular for making uh, underwear for children. Oftentimes you'd get boys underwear that said self-rising and <laughs> they get, because the label never, <laughs> the labels never washed out. They didn't wash out, they were stuck there, you know, so 
<laughs> these little guys up here are string holders right up here and out of their little behind pocket they would poke their string down in there and I brought this board they would make a whole bedspread out of the string they saved they saved everything there wasn't any waste at all it was everything was used and of course there were many quilts that were um, I've got a board up here so you guys can come up and touch you can feel some are finer and some are really rough like burlap almost but anyway you come up and enjoy let me see if I've got anything different here Miss Hazel this is Hazel and she's wearing am I too far oops I'll get on this side I can pull it more okay I don't want to come on just the thought of being on television scares a person to death my gosh Hazel here she is very our air she's pals around with me but this is a dress made out of feed sack and her little buttons were sewn on with a string and we're not real sure this is our vintage it could be the 20s or the 40s the sleeve isn't quite right so those of you that are really good at professional diagnosis of what we wore let me know if you think it is but it could be let's put it that way it could be um, <laughs> I guess I'm ready for my Vanus to get back to duty <laughs> this one here is you could order these um, box to embroidery and they would send the fabric and the thread and everything everything was sent to you in, as a package deal and um, the quilting on this one is just lovely it's really pretty isn't it the next one is a very similar it's called a morning glory summer quilt there's no batting in it so they would put that over <clears throat> and again they ordered those blocks and they came with their fabric and everything and they put them together it was just lovely this one here is the same it was ordered all one piece and I believe it was something like I was looking for my note that I had on it like three dollars and something for the package deal on that but you paid a little bit extra to order your thread here it is I'll read it to you it's out of a 1928 the very same morning glory top and it is uh, you can kind of rest your arms if you're getting those poor girls I know it's hard unbleached sheeting is what they call it on here uh, a close even weave and a creamy tint of this material makes it ideal for this type of needlework so it was three dollars and 25 cents now you could order curtains and a dresser scarf and a fringe to go on this evidently I didn't end up with the fringe <laughs> but I found it in the 1928 Frederick Hirschner Incorporated Chicago Illinois and it's it's identical to to what it is okay the next one is a single morning glory and the purple and bubblegum pink uh, and these blocks are all hand pieced and this is just a top so it hasn't been quilted yet it's something in my future maybe sometimes though I just like to see when things are all hand pieced I like to look at the back and I don't want to quilt it because part of the joy is somebody spent a lot of hours making that okay Nell loves morning glory she 
Yes. It has a huge stash <laughs> of fabric that is all morning light. <laughs> it's a bittersweet story. Our oldest son was killed and he loved morning glories and his, so his wife and I, we have a thing about morning glories. So whenever I see a morning glory, I'm very interested in. Now this is called Colonial Lady and the binding came from the back to the front when they made this one. So she just left enough fabric and folded it right to the front. And that's unusual to how we do it today. We usually make a separate binding. Do I have a lot of quilters in the group? Good, 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 good. So you know what, I'm, I'm not just talking to myself. <laughs> okay. I know, it's fun, isn't it? It's fun. The next one is called Glorified Nine Patch. And I absolutely love it. It's our colors with a scalloped edge. And um, it's just pretty. It's very 30s. So if your little Model A went home to its little Model A house, you would have this on your little Model A bed. <laughs> <laughs> And that has a beautiful bubblegum backing on it. Do these all belong to you? They do. My husband says I have the best insulated house in all of Jacksonville. <laughs> <laughs> this is called um, Dresden Plate. And the little alternate block in the middle is pink and green, which is very much our colors. And uh, it was hand pieced and hand quilted. And I love the little edging going around the whole edge of the border. It's very, very pretty. <coughs> this next quilt is called a double wedding ring. And the blocks were given to <coughs> the Jacksonville Museum quilters to put together. And it was from the 30s and the Jacksonville Museum quilters then hand quilted it and they also made a pillow top to go over your pillows that are are um, made you know to match but um, it's really really pretty and um, double wedding ring there's a few pins here and there in it I've placed the pins there because they forgot to quilt that part so I have to go back and get it one of these days but the quilting's exquisite this was a group effort quilt quilting and I can usually tell if a quilt's been quilted by one person or a group this is a really hard one to tell on because they were all just such good quilters that this is one of my very favorites and I wish it was um, I wish it was brighter for you uh, grandmother's tulips and the binding comes from the back to the front on that one. Um, it is sweet. I'm not sure if it's like 100% cotton because it feels real like a little sheen to it. It's just really different. Isn't Can it pretty? Call it original or is it faded? No, it's original. Yeah, so it it's isn't. Not no, it's not faded. Delicate, so sweet. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Like in some of those when they hand quilted the each block, do they have a pattern, or how do they get them so exact? I know. They I know. A pattern or? I know. Back in the old days, they did not have the rotary cutters like we have, and they usually made their template out of cardboard or something. Um, they were just really good at it, and I have example. Well, one example I'll just share with you right now. <coughs> Where did I put it? Oh, it's over behind Linda. That's the grandmother's flower garden. That's hand pieced. So they would have put each little piece together and it's called what we call Y seams. They would have left a fourth of an inch on each end so they could join it to the next one. And they go on and on and on for hours. I mean, maybe their evening work by candle. You just don't know what kind of light they had. But it takes me, that hoop takes me three hours to hand quilt. Just that hoop. And there's 70 flowers on there, and I'm hand quilting it for a friend. And there's phenomenal quilting on some of these quilts, and my quilting isn't even that good. It, it's less, much less than some of these gals that are doing 12 stitches to the inch. I mean, 
itty bitty tiny, perfect. But in order to answer your question, it, it was a labor of love. Because if I've seen some where they didn't sew them accurately together, and then you get a mess at the end because it grows and it gets really ruffly. And I've got a couple of those that I keep for education purposes to show people what happens when they're not laid out flat and you don't sew the seam right. The next one's called Magnolia Blossom. And the binding on this one matches the little print inside. Isn't that pretty? This one here I found in the magazine too, um, Barbara Brockman, but it was in um, Needlecraft Magazine 1930, the pattern. And it's called uh, All Hands Around, and it's definitely our air. It's Model A. <laughs> and this one's heavier. They've got a little heavier batting in it. It's to keep you warm. I know. Isn't that something? She noticed that, that that pattern continued to the border. This one here, the border is called Streak of Lightning. And this was made um, in the 30s. And I was out for a walk one day in Jacksonville, and there was an estate sale. And I had no money. I was walking my dog. But I went in to look. And here was this gorgeous quilt. And I said, how much? And, and I said, empty pockets. And will you go home and get it, and we'll save it for you. Well, they know everybody knows me there. So <laughs> back I came. I won't tell you how much I paid for it, because you'll all go, oh. But anyway, it wasn't very much. <laughs> and I can't believe that it wasn't swiped away the first two days of the sale. I got there on the last day. So it was meant to come and live with me, I think. So it, I roll them. I'll tell, tell, talk about that a little bit later. This one here is called Double X. It's turkey red. And the binding is sewn on with an old treadle machine. And I can usually tell if it's treadle or regular. It's a treadle. <laughs> it's tighter than, <laughs> tighter than anything. And uh, turkey red is turkey from the country turkey. It's not a um, double X. And now, that could be many other names. I need to tell you, if I give a name, there are other names because the locality you, that you lived, they may be named it differently than, so it would be. Um, yeah, they're not for in the car. No, they're not. No. This next quilt is made for me by a friend. Her name is Nancy Hines. And she wanted you guys to see what 30s reproduction fabric looks like. So this is, this is what we're doing now. And if you look at the fabrics closely, there's a lot of the same colors muted in there that we had for our Model A, so. And Scotty dogs are so popular in the 30s. They were on a lot of things, so. <laughs> it says here that, that the Van Whites get to sit down again. <laughs> woo -hoo -hoo. I'm so glad there's a script because I wouldn't make it without it. <laughs> I wanted to share with you some of the quilts hanging around the room today. Um, this one here is called Table Rock. A local artist wanted you guys to see this one because when you're out and about in our area, if some of you went to the Crater Rock Museum, is that happening already or tomorrow? Look off in the distance and you'll see Crater or Table Rock. And 
the our local artist Evelyn Bryan Williams she designed all the flowers well lo and behold um, the third one down on the left is called red bells and what happened is the Gentner family Mr. Gentner he studied these rare flowers from the university and he said that is not that's a fritillaria so the fritillaria was put on the endangered species of, of course the quilters don't know this they're doing red bells they didn't know how famous they were going to be but anyway the fritillaria is, is listed as an endangered species by the US Fish and Wildlife Service in 1999 and the city of Jacksonville has set aside over 300 acres of habitat for Gentneri fritillaria. Well, my children we used to go through the woods, our house backs up to the woods, and we'd have a bouquet for Sunday morning of fritillaria sitting on the church snack table, you know, for, for the reception room after church. And nobody told them they couldn't pick them, and I didn't know they shouldn't pick them. And, but now I guess you'd get fined a nice hefty charge if you're messing with them. Uh, but anyway, I thought that was kind of cool. So we've had different, this quilt gets out in the community a lot because we just had a recent speaker who talked about the rogue Indian battle and on that whole treaty and they used the quilt. And then we had another talk about the flowers, the wildflowers on Table Rock. and. Others will come and talk about um, landmarks of the area, rocks or whatever. So the quilt gets out to the community. And this quilt is owned by the Jackson County Genealogy Library. And the Jacksonville Mu Museum Quilters gave their historical quilts to the Genealogy Library. And they built a special, um, sort of like these things, that they, these alcoves they have here in the room. Uh, and the quilts are rolled put in a, like a bin, they're rolled, covered with muslin, 100% muslin. The quilts can breathe and they're rolled so you don't get that quilter's cross from folding over and over. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, any questions about this guy? If not, I'll move on. The other quilts over here are, oops, Next to Linda is, in, was it 2008 we did that, Margaret? Margaret and I decided to make a quilt for the raffle room when we had the Northwest meet here. So we worked and worked, and I did the cars with the uh, at G, Jet Ink Ink Jet printer. Blah blah blah. Am I saying that right? And Margaret did all the stars. And then we got together in our little place with our featherweight sewing machines and we sewed up a storm. Anyway, it came time to draw the ticket on the quilt and my husband put one ticket in the pot and he won the quilt. Well, <laughs> another, another group from our Northwest Regional group drew the ticket and another one was the audit so there was no hanky panky but anyway that's Jerry's quilt. First thing he wanted to do was trade it with a man for an engine. <laughs> so anyway it's fond memories and my friend she machine quilted it with uh, Uga all around the border so we thought we should bring it back out. Margaret and I said goodbye to it because we'd worked so hard on it and we said goodbye and we didn't know it was coming back. <laughs> so. And now we have very many dear friends on that quilt that they're no longer with us and so it's really special. I think it was a God thing that, that we got the quilt. Now the last little quilt down there is someone in our committee for this meet asked if I could do a quilt that would represent Oregon. And I thought about Crater Lake because we all love to see Crater Lake. And Phoebe is a little 1928 Phaeton that belonged to, belongs to Eileen and Dick Mace. And they would go up to Crater Lake a lot. And so I had Rick Black take their pictures out of the car where they're sitting and so I could just get the car. And then I went to the builder's supply 
so I could enlarge the pattern. And so on my design wall at home, in my quilting room, and on the big window there, hung Phoebe for quite some time. She's not as detailed as the real Phoebe, but you get the point real, real quick. One man told me I was one spoke short, but <laughs> I'm often more than one spoke short, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, there is a little lad sitting in Phoebe, and he's watching the bears. I think he's more interested in watching the tri Ford motor plane flying over. But anyway, that is a replica of a real vintage postcard from Critter Lake that had Lindbergh flying over and the couple waving, and they had no Phaeton in it. So I didn't think it was worth the price. You know, it didn't have a car. So anyway, you're welcome to buy tickets. There'll be someone here today that'd love to sell you a ticket on that. So let me see, where are we girls? Savannah Whites get to hold the quilts up again. Windblown tulips. <laughs> Marie Webster Design. Marie started a mail order business and also was editor for the Ladies Home Journal. She also wrote quilts, their story, and how to make them. First book published on quilting. This quilt was probably a kit. I would guess. This one came by me quite accidentally. There was a girl who was going off to college and her mother won it in a raffle. And she said, I would just love if you buy this quilt from me so I could take the money to college. So I felt like I did a good deed. <laughs> and and uh, Windblown Tulips resides now with me. This next quilt is called Catherine Kellogg's Grandmother's Flower Garden. Catherine went to, out to Gold Hill, and in those days they were called, um, they weren't called yard sales in those days. It was like a, um, a, a church rummage sale is what it was, and she bought this top. So she came and brought it to me. It's all hand-pieced, and she said, I'd like to have it hand-quilted now and I'll pay you for it. And I said, you know, Catherine, I do not know how to hand quilt, but I'm learning. Can I use it for my practice piece? She said, oh, sure. So home it went with me. And Grandmother's Flower Garden traditionally hand quilted is, is you echo each little cell uh, around each one. So I got it done, finally. The border, or the binding, is the interesting part. It scoops and scoops and scoops and scoops around. And how in the world do you put a binding on? I'm so new at this. I don't know what I'm doing. So I cut it on the bias, thank goodness. But I did it double bias. So that's like a rope going around there. Well, I didn't know any different. So I took it to Catherine. She put it on her bed. Catherine's daughter came to visit. And Catherine's daughter owns a quilt shop back east. And she said, Mother. Where did you get this quilt? Oh, my friend, she quilted it for me. She wouldn't let me charge her, pay her because she's learning. The daughter sat her mother down and she said, Mother, <clears throat> that quilt needs to go back to that lady. Anybody that puts that much work in a quilt needs to have it. <laughs> so Catherine gave it back to me for my birthday, which was December 29th, and I let her have it for the whole year on her spare bed because she, she could have had it longer. She's passed now. And uh, what a thoughtful daughter. I think daughter either, it was pretty bad if she wanted to get rid of it or, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, that was, that was it. Okay, we're now to Maggie's Dresden Plate. Maggie's my granddaughter, and we were over visiting with a friend the other day, and the friend brought this out. She said, Maggie, you might as well start a quilt collection like your grandma. It needs a lot of repairs, and it does. But it's dressed in plate, and Maggie's an artist, so she has already drawn this beautiful oil painting of this and um, made some fabrics of her own, and it's just, you know, really encouraged her. And it's our air, so I asked her if I could have it for today. She said, sure, Grandma. This next one is another summer quilt. That means no batting. 
lots of sewing machine sewing on it, but it's still very pretty, and I think it's going to date us 20s, 30s, not, not just our air, because there's a lot of dark prints in there, and we were more, the 30s, we're, we're happier. We're come out of a depression, and we want to, we want happy in the 30s, so. So I'm pretty sure that's, it's a little pecked fence on the end, I think we'd call it. It's really different. Hmm? This one's got many names, but I chose to call it Joseph's Coat. It's a home art pattern, hand pieced and hand quilted, and the binding back to the front. And the back of this one is very interesting. It's got some oriental look to it. So it could be as early as about 1933 when Sears had that big contest because they had oriental things and then the quilters started doing everything oriental after that. It was quite, so I can't be sure on that one. This one here is, has a lot of Devonshire cloth in it, and here's an advertisement I found for the Devonshire cloth. It was rugged, and it shows pictures of little kids sliding down the banister. <laughs> and it was expressly made to stand hard wear. This is a tied quilt. It's a uh, made utility, they call this, a utility quilt. So it keep you warm, but it's our colors. And it's our Devonshire cloth, <laughs> so it's our period. <laughs> Someone talked earlier about um, taking care of your quilts. How do I care? Um, at home, I have the rollers system, and I roll them up and cover them, and I don't let light get to them. Light, quilts are just like us. They have to breathe, and not too much light. You'll see a beautiful example of a quilt and they've had it on a bed and one whole side is sun bleached, you know, and you'll see that in stores. But if you find, don't give up on a quilt just because it has the quilter's cross, but when you fold it in half and fold it in half and it sits for 20 years, then when you open it out, you're gonna have this, they call it the quilter's cross. And fabric has a memory, so it's gonna remember that and it stays there forever and it won't come out. So rolling is ideal. And one of the things we've been doing recently is we're folding our quilts diagonally. So even if it's not square, you can kind of square it up a little bit and then fold over corner to corner and keep going and stuff it in a cotton pillowcase, if that's what you have, and then refold them once or twice a year. So it's got new lines to memorize. It's not the quilter's cross, so that works. If you, it depends on what your rod is. On my rod, I have um, a, a little piece of batting sl slit on my rod. Some rods are just metal. There isn't anything coming off. Them on a rod. Yeah, I'm rolling them on a, on a metal rod. And um, it works great. And we do that at the genealogy library too. They're all the on a rod. Um, this is like, say this is a lot of quilts, and yeah, you're that's, those, how would you, you <laughs> they're slot, they're slotted on, I have two boards going up the wall with, with slots in them, so you'd stack them down the wall, but you need to have a big room for that, that's, another thing that really works well is if you have a spare bedroom, one of the quilters, Judy Matheson, she came up and stayed with me in Jacksonville. Then I told her I may be coming down to her place, and she said, oh, I gotta get the quilts off the guest bed because she can't have me until the, they're removed. But it's really healthy for them to lay flat on a bed. It's another good way to, to preserve them. They are wonderful to have. They're also, um, kind of a chore because you got to keep keep them nice and take care of them and they're a textile they can you know fade away you know thread or whatever C 
crazy quilts are notorious for the dyes that they had in those early days and they just, there's nothing left. They're just, they disintegrate in your hands. This is the other thing you don't want to do ever. Store them in plastic. Suck the air out. Now I brought all of these in plastic bags today because of the rain, but I'm not leaving them in there. But this is, one lady asked me, can I just put all my quilts and I, they only take up a little bit of room, but like I said, the quilts need to breathe just like we do. And this has chemicals in it that's really bad for the fabric. Oh, it's not, not good. Okay, there's the hand out. I think this is the conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's your